Hey everyone, welcome back to my channel. I have a lot of announcements to make. Number one, please subscribe, like, click that notification bell, and please comment on what book you would like me to do next because it may actually get featured in one of these videos if a lot of other people vote for it or vote on it. Second announcement, we will be having a reading marathon. And how this reading marathon works is we will be having a, um, if you get as many people as you know to subscribe and say subscribed until the next reading marathon, you will get your book featured on this channel. All you have to do is send me an email. I will put my email back on the little I so you can definitely see my email. And if you get as many people as you can to subscribe and stay subscribed. So how your email is going to look is you're going to write, Dear Little Readers, Dear Rapid Readers, I got how many people you got to subscribe. So say like you got 12 people to subscribe. And then below, you're going to have the link to your video or how I can watch your video. So you're going to say, hello, rapid readers. I got however many people you did to subscribe. And then you're going to link me to your video. And I will, if, I will see how many people subscribe. And if we have great turnout, then you will get fe featured on this video. I would like to say, please don't lie about how many people you su you get to subscribe, because I want to know the truth, and I want to have, I want, because the subscribers is just honest, guys, to share the love of reading. I want people to know about this channel, so more people can have more stories and more reading, so please don't be untruthful about how many people you get to subscribe third of all my sister has a channel hashtag creativity 101 she is a great artist and if you're an absolutely be absolute beginner you've only done one or two drawings and honestly in your opinion you don't think they're that good she does a lot of activities with watercolor paints she's actually sh um, uploading a video right now on how to brush letter if you're an absolute beginner. So she is a great person to go to. Anyway, let's get to the start of this video. Today we'll be reading George Crumb and the Saratoga Chip by Galia Taylor, illustrated by Frank Morrison. George Crumb and the Saratoga Chip. George stood before the students in the one-room schoolhouse. His palms were sweaty and his knees were weak. All the first graders could count to 100 except George. His sister, Kate, sat across the room with the older students. Kate helped George practice his numbers at home every night and was always encouraging him. He looked at Kate, took a deep breath, and started to count. George counted up to 68, then he got confused and couldn't remember which number came next. The other children laughed, and George felt his skin begin to prickle. So here are all the students laughing, and here's George, um, sweating a lot because he can't count to 100. I guess he's a teacher right there. And um, we can infer from this picture, this is not present day or recently because a one-room schoolhouse, we don't have those anymore. Um, we do have them at, like, old museum sites and things like that to, like, show for show, but we people don't actually learn in those. And also, there's this little ink bowl, and we do not write with feathers anymore. We write with pencils. Um... And two people usually don't sit at a desk. And look at this old boiler or old heater. Like, who uses those? I've never seen those ever. And they still do have blackboards. 
but mostly whiteboards to um, where you write your expo with. Anyway, it was difficult for George and Kate. It was difficult for George and Kate growing up in the 1830s. This is in the 1830s, guys. They were part Native American and part African American at a time when people of color in the United States were often treated as inferior to white people. George had a feisty streak, and he would get frustrated when other children laughed at him or acted as if they were better than he was. He wanted them to know he was just as good as they were. When George was with Kate, his feistiness turned playful and mischievous. He joked with his sister. He teased her. He taught Kate to climb a tree and shoot a bow and arrow better than any boy in the country. So that's what's called um, segregation in the 1960s. Actually, in all the 1900s, they have what's called segregation. And that's exactly what he described, where um, black people were treated as inferior, which means less than white people. George loved the outdoors. He spent hours fishing and exploring the nearby Adronate. Uh, let me try to say this out. Adirondack, Adirondack Mountains. He watched the wild turkeys strut around with their hens, fascinated by their iridescent colors. He listened carefully and practiced imitating their calls. This amused George for hours. This is him on his, in the mountains, fishing. I like the illustrations a lot because it just really depicts, like, I if I was there. So this, um, he's fishing here in the pond, and here's some birds and some lily pads. And sorry, guys, I forgot to show you the last picture. And I guess that's his house, I'm not sure. He's doing archery here. This is an old target. You have to board pieces of wood and just paint them up. And that's his sister. And that's him teaching her. After he finished his schooling, George began fishing and hunting full time. He made a living by selling fresh fish and wild game to nearby restaurants. Game is like, um, if I kill a deer, that's game. I'm like hunting what you get out of hunting to nearby restaurants. One day, George met a Frenchman hunting in the mountains. The Frenchman was an excellent cook. He taught George how to prepare his fresh fish and game over the open flames of an outdoor fire. George quickly discovered he had a passion for cooking. He experimented with different spices and cooking techniques. A pinch of salt here, some extra heat here, until each recipe was just right. Soon, George had perfected many delicious meals. Freshly roasted game birds, peach, poached fish, grilled venison, and more. Is that venison? Ven venison? And so this is um, obviously George as he gets older and, you know, looks, starts to look different, grow hair, grow taller. And this is a Frenchman. And here they are cooking. There's some fish bones here and a little napkin here. And the flame is here. And that looks like an egg right there. That's the Frenchman. George wanted to show all of Saratoga Springs what a good cook he was. He decided the best way to do this was to become a chef in a restaurant. It wasn't easy for George to get a job as a chef in those days. Most restaurant owners wouldn't hire a man of color to be anything but a waiter. George didn't let that stop him. Sure enough, George's... Excuse me. George's excellent cooking skills shone through. He landed a job at Moon's Lake House, one of the best restaurants in Saratoga Springs. George's heart swelled when he thought when he thought about all the people who would now enjoy his meals. 
So he's in town trying to get a job, make a way for himself, children playing. And this person said no um, because he's Native American and um, African American. And as I said, it was hard for people to get jobs back then. So this is what is called a biography, where someone writes a loosely based or exactly based story, picture book or chapter book about someone's life, or at least how it was a little bit back then. George quickly became famous for his wild game and fish dishes. Prominent people, including Cornelius Vanderbilt, one of the richest men in America, traveled great distances to eat at Moon's Lake House. Um, George's most sought-after dish was his ca- canvas back duck. It was so tender and juicy that no other chef in the area could match its taste. That's him serving all the people, the waiters, all the people eating. George enjoyed creating new recipes at Moon's Lake House, but he soon realized he had little patience for the fussy customers. They demanded immediate attention to their needs and were quick to complain. They acted as if they were better than people serving them, something George did not like in the least. Luckily, Kate worked at a waitress at the restaurant. She tried her best to keep George in good spirits and his feistiness from getting the better of him. Again, everyone's eating at Moon's Lake House. And I can see some proper people. Like, there's a proper lady here. Here, there's a man in a suit and tie. A woman there, all in their fancy clothes. This is considered a very fancy restaurant, apparently. Moon's Lake House. One evening, a customer complained to Kate that his meal was not hot enough. Kate apologized, picked up the man's plate, and headed swiftly toward the kitchen. George knew the meal he had sent out had been perfectly prepared, but he also knew he had to please the restaurant's customers. So he carefully scraped the tender quail and vegetables into a black iron skillet over hot flames. After a few minutes, George tested the temperature of the food and decided it was just right. <clears throat> With great care, he scooped everything onto a fresh plate and placed it onto a silver platter. George wiped the sweat from his brow, straightened his brow, straightened his starch his starched white chef's apron, and stepped out. And wait, he um. He wa- George wiped the sweat from his brow, straightened the s- his starched white chef's apron, and stepped out into the dining room. So, uh, Kate says, like, I think that's Kate, and he's cooking there with all the other chefs, and he's cooking it again because the person complained. There was a Proud of his efforts, George placed the hot meal in front of the customer. The man took a small bite, then announced at school that the food was not still not hot enough. George's skin prickled. He tried to hide his, his annoyance and gave the man a weak smile. Without a word, George took the plate and quickly turned. All of a sudden, he lost his balance and tripped. So it seems like George is relatively tall here. Um, it could just be the illustration, so. A ripple of laughter passed through the dining room and George hit the floor. His cheeks grew hot and flushed. As George brushed himself off, he heard a woman whisper loudly about the poor quality of the staff. George felt just like he was back in first grade, trying to count to 100. He headed to the safety of the kitchen, hoping the night would soon be over. So maybe he works the night shift because it just said the night. George continued to have good days and bad days with the customers at Moon's Lake House. He still loved cooking, but his patience for pleasing difficult customers was growing on growing thin. One then one hot summer day in August 1853. So this is like 23 years later. Something happened that changed George's life forever. It was lunchtime, 
and Moon's Lake House was packed. A woman ordered French fried potatoes, a relatively new and fashionable item at the time. Some chefs would have shied away from making something new when the restaurant was so busy, but George was sure his friend, the f- his friend, the French woodman, had taught him how to make perfect French fries. So George cooked up a piping hot batch and sent them out to the customer. So, uh, 1853, French fries were relatively new. So, the French fries are really old, and they look really good from what I'm seeing here. And back then, they probably had much less salt because they had to go and dig it out of the Himalayas. But now they have more tools and um, have more heavy-duty tools to do that. The woman looked at the plate of french fries and, before even taking a bite, complained to the waiter that the potatoes were cut too thick. The waiter knew not to argue with a customer, so he graciously took the french fries back into the kitchen. George was shocked to see the potatoes returned. He had just about enough of fussy customers. George grabbed a potato and started slicing. Keith saw a spark of feistiness in her brother's eyes that she hadn't seen in quite a while. So this is the lady, the waiter, giving her the french fries, and she's like, no, take them back. And again, that's a proper lady. So Moon's Lake House must be very proper. George was very, very careful to cut the potatoes very, very thin. So thin that when he held the slice up to the light, he could see straight through it. He put the slices into a pot full of hot oil. He purposely cooked the potatoes longer at a higher temperature than was needed for perfect french fries. So he really wants to perfect this because he's like, I'm fed up with this. I'm not going to have any more of this. I'm going to perfect it. When the potatoes were crisp and brown, George removed them from the oil and piled them onto the plate. He decided to serve his special new creation to the customer himself. Kate and other members of the staff peered anxiously through the kitchen doors. Their eyes were glued to the woman. No one wanted to miss her reaction. George presented the plate of fried potatoes and waited for the woman's complaints. So, there she is eating it. She took a small bite, then another, and another. Finally, she declared them the most delicious potato delicacy she had ever tasted. George was stunned. He didn't know what to say. He mumbled his thanks and returned to the kitchen in a daze. This, what does this look a lot like? Or, on the plate, what does that look a lot like? It's very thin, crispy, and maybe with lay cells. Hmm. Let's see. From that day on, everybody who came to Moon's Lake House wanted the new potato creation. Soon people were calling them the Saratoga Chips, in honor of Saratoga Springs where the restaurant was located. George continued cooking at Moon's Lake House for several years, but then he got to thinking it was time to leave. He still didn't like cooking for people who looked down on other folks and treated them badly. So he's like, oh, wow, my new creation. Everyone wants it. And here's a little family eating this little man over here. Um, George started dreaming of his own restaurant, a comfortable place where anyone could enjoy a meal and everyone would be treated equally. George was confident that with his cooking skills and the popularity of his Saratoga chips, he could make his own way in the restaurant business. After leaving Moon's Lake House, George bought some land and built a restaurant that he named Crumb's Place because his name is George Crumb. On the surrounding farmland, he raised chickens, cows, and pigs and grew vegetables and fruit. All the food served in the restaurant came fresh from the farm, including the potatoes for George's famous chips. George was proud of his restaurant. He nestled among tall shade he nestled among tall shade trees and had an inviting front porch facing a lake. 
It was a comfortable place where diners could enjoy good fun and laughter. So, Geo, George Crumb, that Geo is short for George Crumb, Crumb's place. I think that he invented the potato chip, because that looked a lot like a potato chip. There were always long lines at Crumb's place, and customers had to wait their turns for seats in the dining room. So George devised a rule that made him very happy indeed. Rich or poor, light-skinned or dark, young or old, female or male, anybody had to wait just the same, because everyone was equal at Crumb's place. And if any customers happened to fuss about waiting their turn, good old Cr- George would send a feist, uh, get a feisty look in his eyes and say, if you can't wait, get your grub at Moon's. Like Moon's Lake House. And yeah. So that's, I think that this looks like a potato chip. If I show you personally. If I show you. This looks a lot like a potato chip. I don't know about you. Um, but that is a potato chip. Um, that's the meaning of the whole story. Um, so that's George Crumb and the Saratoga chip. And today, we still have potato chips. Um, so thank you for watching this video. Again, don't forget our reading marathon. Try to get as many people as you can to subscribe. Send me a video with you in it. My email address is littlereaders76 at gmail.com. Littlereaders, one word, 76 at gmail.com. And tell me how many people you got to subscribe and say subscribe until February 7th. That's the deadline. And then I'll see, look through all my emails and on all my videos, I'll say who has the most and what number they have, um, depending on how many emails I've gotten. And on February 7th, 2021, we are going to calculate for this first annual reading marathon who got the most people to subscribe. And if they sent in a book video with that, with that um, they will be featured on this video. I will also have my sister, Creativity 101, hashtag Creativity 101, on this channel sometime. So the person could also send in not something too sophisticated of what they want to draw. Um, and they could do uh, something that they say or like a little picture of something that they like to do. And I will have my sister do it for you because she will guest star sometime but let me remind you that may not be exactly on february 7th um like the book reading the book reading will be on february 7th or before but the art may be a little after because my sister is busy with her own channel but um please like subscribe comment on if you have a book that you want me to read i think next month we're gonna have like a week of Dr. Seuss. So the week after February 7th, our reading marathon, I think we're going to have some Dr. Seuss, and I don't know, but I think we're going to have a really good two months of this channel. Don't forget about my sister's channel, hashtag, hashtag Creativity101, and don't forget our mar- about our marathon. Thank you for watching this video. Like, subscribe, and comment. Thank you guys so much for watching this video. Bye.